back to history class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the Washington presidency, and we've spent a good bit of our time so far talking about domestic affairs and the evolution of what becomes the two-party system. In this lecture, we're going to turn to foreign affairs and diplomacy under Washington. As we will see, the two-party system has its influence there as well, but we'll talk primarily about foreign affairs and some of the treaties that were developed during the Washington presidency. The dispute between Jefferson and Hamilton spills over into foreign affairs, where one of the pressing questions in the early years of the Republic was whether we should align ourselves more closely with France or with Britain. Now, in some ways, the answer to this might seem obvious because we have, in our recent past, just fought a war for independence from Britain. And there were many reasons to be concerned about getting too close in our relationship with Britain. Britain had, in fact, not followed all of the elements of the Treaty of Paris. There were still troops along the Ohio River Valley in some of those forts. They had refused to return fugitive slaves, and there were other disputes, like territorial disputes, on the Canadian border. We also had a negative trade balance with Britain at that time, meaning that they sold us more goods than they were buying. Although some argued that along the argument of keep your friends close and your enemies closer, because Britain was potentially our most dangerous enemy, it might be good to keep them as an ally. There seem to be perhaps more compelling reasons to maintain a closer alliance with France. After all, we were literally allies with France from a formal alliance from 1778, near the end of the Revolutionary War. So there were now questions as to whether we needed to honor that alliance. France also gave us better trading rates, and we had a positive trade balance with France. France was also not an immediate threat in this hemisphere. As we've discussed a number of times, they had been essentially removed from influence in North America. And so it would seem Britain posed a greater immediate threat. We're also going to be talking in just a minute about the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, and some Americans viewed the French Revolution as a closer uh, demonstration of kinship with the French. Um, others, particularly viewing the increasing violence of that revolution, uh, kind of turned against it. So there's disagreement whether we need to be closer aligned to Britain or France. Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of Treasury, arguing primarily from the economic perspective, argued that we needed to be closer to Britain, which was our largest trading partner at that time. And we needed a considerable volume of trade to support the policies he was trying to enact, involving paying off the debt from the Revolutionary War and setting up a national bank. Thomas Jefferson was more an admirer of the French and argued that we should maintain closer ties with France, who, as I've noted, were actually officially our allies at that point. So Washington attempts to deal with these issues. His main policy, we might call independent internationalism, take part in foreign affairs, but on our terms. Washington advocated forming commercial alliances rather than political ones. He also noted that as a relatively new and relatively weak power, it was in our interest to stay out of the grand geopolitics of the rest of the world and particularly to stay out of foreign wars. He also did argue for westward expansion and the continued growth of our country. And as we will see, a number of his policies and treaties related to securing the ability for the country to expand to the West. In 1789, France descended into revolution. Initially, most Americans supported the French Revolution because it bore resemblances and, in fact, borrowed language from America's own revolution. Even the Federalist paper, the Gazette of the United States, described the French Revolution 
as, quote, one of the most glorious objects that can attest the attention of mankind. But the French Revolution turned much more radical and gruesome. The execution of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette in 1793 were particularly gruesome. And so many Americans began to turn against their support for the French Revolution at that time. So the French Revolution became yet another point of division between Republicans and Federalists. Many Republicans supported the ideals of the French Revolution and were willing to overlook its violence. Federalists, meantime, viewed the French Revolution, once it grew violent, as horrific and sadistic, and they maintained their support more for Britain. In 1792, France and Britain resumed their long-standing rivalry and declared war once again, which brought into question which nation will we support in this growing conflict. Both France and England, incidentally, damaged the United States during this time in the form of stopping American ships, sometimes seizing the contents or other atrocities on the seas. So American trade was suffering from both countries. In 1793, George Washington made the first official statement of American foreign policy, a proclamation of neutrality that we were not going to get involved in the war between France and Britain. By doing this, he overlooked the alliance with France from 1778, which made Hamilton and their Federalists happy and made Jefferson and the Republicans, along with the French, unhappy. As mentioned, during this war between Britain and France, the British Navy impounded more than 250 American ships, in many cases seizing their cargo. This brought to light the growing conflict between the United States and Britain and inspired George Washington to send as a special envoy to London the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, who had actually helped to write the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Jay returned from England with a treaty called Jay's Treaty, by which Britain agreed to compensate America for the cargo they had seized and to vacate forts in the Northwest Territory. However, the treaty did not require the British to deny that they had the right to do such things, and they didn't accept the right of neutral nations to trade freely with belligerents, in other words, for the United States to trade with France. When Jay returned, he was met in many quarters with outrage. Republicans thought the treaty yielded far too much to the British, and Jay was burned in effigy across much of the country. It's worth noting, though, that Jay negotiated with Britain from a position of weakness. It would have been hard for him to demand much more, and just the fact that he was able to get compensation from the British and for them to vacate the forts in the Northwest Territory was an indication of some success. Public opinion over Jay's treaty actually turned in the months that followed, most notably when President Washington supported the treaty, which he judged to be reasonable under the circumstances and didn't view that he could have extracted too much more from the British in negotiation. There was vicious debate between Republicans in the House and Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and others on the Federalist side. The House, as much as they might have been outraged over this, as it turned out, really didn't have much power in this case, an argument made by George Washington himself, but also made by Alexander Hamilton, who published a series of essays under a pseudonym, making arguments that treaty-making powers lie with the President and with the Senate. And in fact, public opinion began to turn in favor of the treaty, and Republicans in the House found themselves falling out of favor on this issue. As we will see, Jay's treaty, which was once unpopular, became a significant turning point in the election of 1796. Public opinion over Jay's treaty might also have been bolstered 
by support for another treaty, Pinckney's Treaty, which was drawn in 1795 between America and Spain. This treaty, which was drawn from a position of strength, was much more favorable to America and secured America's right to navigate the Mississippi River and the port of New Orleans, and also a favorable boundary between the United States and Spanish Florida. And with the positive view of Pinckney's treaty, the view of Jay's treaty began to further improve. Washington also had to grapple with some pesky domestic disputes, most notably the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, which arose out of opposition to the whiskey tax that had been implemented under Alexander Hamilton's plan. Protest against the tax began peacefully, and angry farmers on the frontier eventually uh, grew more frustrated and turned violent. In July 1794, 500 Western Pennsylvania farmers marched to the home of one of the tax collectors named John Neville uh, and intimidated him. In this attack, two protesters were killed and Neville's house was burned to the ground. This army uh, on the frontier grew until eventually Washington dispatched the militia to the frontier and resistance to the government finally crumbled. 150 people ultimately were arrested and two were convicted of treason, although in the interest of maintaining peace, Washington pardoned those two who were convicted. With so much attention on foreign affairs, the turning opinion on Jay's treaty and the success of Pinckney's treaty, Federalists were once again able to win victory in the election of 1796. In the presidential election, it was John Adams who would now assume the presidency in the aftermath of George Washington, who in yet another of his acts of civic virtue had elected not to run for re-election one more time. The Federalists won a clear majority. The numbers are a little bit unclear given the unclear party lines at that time, but it was about 64 to 43 uh, in the House and they would continue to hold a majority in the Senate as well. And so the Republicans had learned a stinging lesson that when foreign affairs were at the top of the list of concerns, it was hard to defeat the incumbent party. They also realized it was going to be difficult for them to get things done until they held the presidency along with both houses of Congress. Incidentally, Washington, on his way out of office, delivered a poignant farewell address in 1796, which was not actually read publicly, but was in the form of a letter. This address a number, addressed a number of issues confronting the nation, among them the growing factionalization and partisan politics, but also he made an appeal for no entangling foreign alliances, which is something we will come back to in this course and really throughout our history time and time again.